Chapter 4 is entitled Sustainable Development. The Brundtland Commission in 1987, w which is cited in your book on page 54, gave the first definition of sustainable development. Before 1987, the term sustainable development uh, wasn't used. Sustainability was used, but only in the context of renewable resources. So their definition was here, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is somewhat problematic. It raises the question, is it possible to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs? George S. Rogan was pessimistic because he thought that exhaustible natural resources were essential to advanced economies and if, you, if this generation uses up an exhaustible natural resource then it's not available for future generations. Other people have been uh, less pessimistic than Georgescu. There are two kinds of ethical questions that are raised. Intergenerational equity, which is equity within one generation, but perhaps more I don't want to say more important, but this discussion of sustainability highlights the second kind of equity, which is intergenerational equity, that is equity between members of different generations. Now, how can sustainability be achieved? Well, economists distinguish two different types of sustainability called weak sustainability and strong sustainability. Weak sustainability is related to the total stock of capital in an economy. This means man-made capital, also I suppose so-called human capital, which is education of the, of the population, but also natural capital. A Canadian economist named John Hartwick has enunciated Hartwick's rule, which is if you keep capital, that is, all capital constant, then the result is going to be sustainability, constant consumption and constant net national product. A net national product is different from gross national product because it subtracts out depreciation. Now, just by arithmetic, the way you keep capital constant is by balancing depreciation with investment. So depreciation measures how your capital runs down. You can think about machines wearing out, you can think about machines becoming obsolete, but you can also think about your coal mines running out of coal, your copper mines running out of copper, your oil fields running out of oil. All those are examples of depreciation. So that means capital falling. Investment means capital rising. And the idea here is that if if your investment can be greater than or equal to your depreciation, then you can keep all capital constant. And Hartwick's rule then says you have you have sustainability. Now the question is, yes, this is true on paper. Is it feasible in the real world? The weak sustainability depends on being able in some important way to add all different kinds of capital together to get one measure of an economy's capital. So you're adding the capital embodied in automobile manufacturing plants with the capital embodied in apartment buildings throughout the country with the capital embodied in all the nation's forests and with the assimilative capacity that is a self-cleansing capacity of its rivers. So if that aggregate sum makes sense, then you're in a world where weak sustainability makes sense, and if you follow Hartwick's rule that you keep all capital constant, that you keep this aggregate sum of all the capital constant, you'll be sustainable. But this may not be feasible. There, it, it, there might be some sense in which you have an essential, let's say, an essential exhaustible resource. Petro perhaps society can't exist without petroleum anymore. Uh, then, if petroleum runs out, uh, it it doesn't help that you've increased 
the amount of some other capital stock, the economy is still doomed. So weak sustainability really depends on the assumption that you can substitute artificial capital, man-made capital, for natural capital. If you can't, then the relevant concept is strong sustainability, where each environmental and resource sector has to be sustained separately because there you can't uh, you can't substitute one for the other. So strong sustainability means you have to apply the sustainability criterion sector by sector to each individual, let's say, exhaustible resource, renewable resource, and waste assimilative capacity of the environment. And now, whether which one of these is describes the real world is a matter of debate. Uh, I think your textbook authors and I lean towards strong sustainability as being more important. And we think that the assumptions that are required in order to be only worried about weak sustainability are pretty strong assumptions, these the substitutability assumptions that are unlikely to be satisfied in the real world. So what are your authors write about the overall operational principles that would result in sustainable development? Well, they have a five-point plan, which they say is certainly not complete, but it's a start. The first point in the plan, correct externalities. And we've engaged by now in a lot of study about how to do that. The second point in the plan, let me read, maintain the regenerative capacity of renewable natural capital. So to say harvesting rates should not exceed regeneration rates. So that's talking about natural resources and renewable natural resources. And so you should exploit them in a sustainable way. So harvesting rates should not exceed regeneration rates. OK, so that's about renewable natural resources. Then their next uh, quote, the quote that starts here, is about environmental economics. It's about pollution. Avoidance of excessive pollution, which could threaten waste assimilator capacities and life support systems. So some amount of pollution is OK, because the environment has these self-cleansing properties for some pollutants. That's the waste assimilation, uh, assimilation capacities. But pollution should never be so much that it overwhelms the waste assimilation capacities and it threatens life support systems. Okay. Number three, encourage substitution away from using exhaustible resources and towards using renewable resources. So here's an example that I come up with. Um, for example, plastics. Now, I know there are some plastics made from renewable sources. <coughs> But in this sentence, let's just think about plastics made from petroleum. And um, fossil fuels are clearly non-renewable resources. Um, we could substitute those for wood. So lots of things like, let's say, <coughs> children's toys um, could be made from wood instead of plastics. Instead of burning fossil fuels, we could burn wood. Now, this would require probably instead of burning fossil fuels, moving to burning wood would probably require a much smaller population size because there's a limit to how much wood we can burn every year. Of course, there are other kinds of renewable sources of energy like solar energy and wind energy, so it wouldn't have to go all the way, but these are just examples. Uh, number four, it's okay to extract non-renewable resources, your author suggests, but only at a rate equal to the creation of renewable substitutes for those resources, including recycling. I should add that there's a typo in your book. This is a point four, page 61. Um, they, the book starts by saying that renewable natural resources should be exploited, but they meant uh, non-renewable uh, here. It's, it's okay to extract non-renewable resources. And finally, uh, number five, the overall scale of economic activity must be limited so that it remains within the carrying capacity of the remaining natural capital. Given the uncertainties present, a precautionary approach should be adopted with a built-in safety margin. So this is limiting the scale of the economy to be within the carrying capacity of the environment. The 
precautionary approach here is related to the precautionary principle, which is something that David Pierce uh, invented. And I mentioned that it's as it's reflected in some European Union environmental regulations. The precautionary principle says that when there's uncertainty, when there's doubt, always take the policy action which protects the environment. And it's also related to the idea of safe minimum standard that uh, de determine what amount of the pollution is going to cause no damage at all. And this suggests to regulate to that level. In other words, instead of doing a fine, finely tuned cost-benefit analysis to see what the level of pollution should be, just figure out what the safe level of pollution is, the, the level of pollution that the environment itself can clean up and then set that as a standard. Now, this is an industry tend not to like the precautionary principle and not to like regulation based on safe minimum standards. But environmentalists uh, do tend to like them. I finally want to end here on the right with a diagram that comes from the Daily Townsend book, uh, Valuing the Earth. This is the beginning of that book. It's a uh, contribution by Daly himself from a work called Introduction to Essays Toward a State of State Economy, and it's page 20 of the Daly and Townsend book. So let me switch to that screen. So figure, it's figure 1.1. It's entitled The Ends Means Spectrum. Economics is defined in freshman economics books as being the study of how to allocate scarce means to uh, achieve certain desired ends. And that's where the word ends means spectrum comes in. Now, Daly uses the term political economy to mean standard neoclassical economics and suggests that what standard neoclassical economics does is confine itself to the relationship between intermediate means and intermediate ends. By intermediate means, he refers to stocks of artifacts, labor power, so stocks of artifacts would be capital goods, machines, and intermediate ends, health, education, and comfort. But Daly suggests that in order to really be sure that the economy is doing what you want it to do, you should study the relationship between ultimate means and the ultimate end. Now by ultimate means, Daly here writes low entropy matter energy. I don't think I would describe it in that way. I would simply say valuable matter and energy. That's the ultimate means, maybe ma valuable matter energy, but perhaps also the valuable characteristics of the ecosystem, the biological characteristics of the ecosystem. And these are the ultimate means that generate the things that make human life more comfortable. Physics is the study of the ultimate means. The relationship between the ultimate means and the intermediate means, Daly here calls technics. You might want to call that engineering. And then the ultimate end is the ultimate purpose of life. Yes, there's a question mark there because people will disagree on what the ultimate purpose of life is. But Daly doesn't think it makes sense to think that there is no ultimate end. And you'll recall that his more recent book, For the Common Good, he co-wrote with a theologian, so he's certainly interested in talking about what the ultimate end might be. And so religion, or theology, is the study of the ultimate end. The relationship between intermediate ends and the ultimate end is here given by ethics. And so Daly suggests that a full and proper economic investigation of what an economy is doing and what it should be doing needs to take into account not only intermediate means and intermediate ends, but a study, or at least an appreciation to some extent, the study of ultimate means and the ultimate end. 
So I think I'll leave it here, uh, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, to some extent, I think during this semester we have accomplished some of what Daly has in mind and lays, lays out.